right, good morning, everyone. My name is Rachel Harwitz, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Caribou Biosciences. Caribou is a CRISPR gene editing company. We're about six years old, based in Berkeley, California, co-founded by some of the inventors of the original CRISPR-Cas9 technology, Jennifer Doudna and Martin Yinnick. Um, Today, Caribou has in hand a best-in-class, most specific CRISPR gene editing platform that we've developed at the company that we refer, refer to as the Chardonnay technology. And we call it that because our guide molecules are unlike what Mother Nature gave us in the original CRISPR-Cas9 system. They're molecules that we have developed that have some DNA nucleotides and some RNA nucleotides. And so our team refers to this as the CRISPR hybrid RNA DNA or Chardonnay for short. With this platform and other CRISPR based gene editing platforms in hand, the company is investing in developing our own internal pipeline of therapeutic products in two key areas. The first is gene edited cell therapies for immuno oncology, starting with off the shelf CAR T therapies and broadening from there. And the second space is what we call bugs as drugs using gene editing technologies to site specifically manipulate the genome of microbes in order to treat various human diseases. Um, our team is about 60 people, all based in Berkeley, California. Uh, to date, we've raised only about 42 million in terms of dilutive capital, um, and we've raised quite a bit more than that in terms of non-dilutive capital through various partnership and licensing transactions over the past few years. Um, our pipeline today, as I mentioned, consists of products, uh, product candidates in two key areas. And I'll focus on the first one for this morning, which is the gene edited cell therapy space. Our lead program is called CB10, which is an anti CD19 allogeneic CAR T therapy. So, this is where we're taking healthy T cells from healthy donors as the start point for our cell therapy manufacturing. In this program, we're making two key modifications using our Chardonnay gene editing platform in order to manufacture these cells. The first is a multifunctional modification where we're simultaneously deleting the T cell receptor in order to prevent causing graft versus host disease, as well as site specifically inserting the CAR into a given location in the genome. And we accomplish this by putting the CAR directly into the track gene which is what codes for the alpha chain of the T cell receptor. We do this by delivering a CAR via AAV6 and then cutting the appropriate site in the track gene using the Chardonnay technology to site specifically insert that gene cassette. Second, we're genetically deleting PD1 by knocking out the gene that encodes it, PDCD1, in the T cell genome. And the purpose of this modification is to really boost the persistence and the anti-tumor activity of these cells while they exist in the patient. Um, in an allogeneic context, we fully expect that the patient's own immune system will eventually clear the T cell therapy, which is appropriate. However, we want to make sure while the T cells are there, they're as active as possible against the target tumor. One of the things that can happen, of course, which is well understand, understood in the immuno-oncology space, is that T cells can rapidly become overstimulated and then actually exhausted and no longer functional. And so by deleting PD-1 specifically from the CAR T cells, we believe we'll be able to boost the length of time during which we get appropriate anti-tumor activity. Given how little time we have this morning, I won't go into too many details about the other programs in our pipeline. Uh, but just at a high level, I'll say we have additional allogeneic CAR-T products, as, as well as work ongoing in um, non-T cell immune cells as we're broadening out the portfolio of different immune cells that have valuable anti-tumor potential for the immuno-oncology space. And with that, I'd be happy to take some of your questions. Thank you, Rachel. So maybe to start, I think it would be uh, appropriate just to orient the audience. Um, obviously, CRISPR-Cas9 is a hot space. You see a lot of headlines um, in the news and um, obviously some IP questions in terms of who owns what, and, and you know that's been talked about over the years. So I think it would be helpful just to, to um, maybe lay out for the audience, where does the IP come from for Caribou, and how are you guys intertwined, I guess, with some of the public companies that we know of, and just the story behind um, how this technology emerged and became Caribou? Sure, great, great question. Um, so when we first founded Caribou, 
Uh, basically, the first thing I did was work with the University of California to access really the foundational CRISPR-Cas9 IP. So Caribou is the exclusive licensee of both the University of California and the University of Vienna for their rights in the foundational work done by Jennifer Doudna and her colleagues. Um, since then, Caribou has gone on to build a fairly extensive portfolio of other, mostly CRISPR, though some non-CRISPR-based gene editing platforms. Um, some of which we've accessed through relationships with other universities uh, beyond just the University of California and, and Vienna, um, and others that we've developed at Caribou. Um, so for example, the, the Chardonnay technology is something that came out of our collaboration with DuPont Pioneer several years ago, uh, is intellectual property that Pioneer owns and is exclusively licensed today to Caribou for human therapeutic applications. Uh, part of our history also within this space is that we were happy to work with folks at Atlas Venture years ago to spin out Intellia Therapeutics. And so they have rights to some of our uh, CRISPR uh, technologies through the license that was granted by Caribou to Intellia several years ago. Okay, and, and what insight, I guess, did you have regarding the CRISPR-Cas9 machinery um, that you know, uh, led you guys to iterate on it, obviously, with Chardonnay and, and, and maybe improve on sort of what the original platform was? Yeah, our, our history as a company is perhaps a little bit unusual. Um, we started life as a broad platform technology organization where we were explicitly not developing our own products, but instead partnering with companies, not only in healthcare, but across many different industries, hence our work with DuPont Pioneer on the food side. Um, and that gave us really good insight into what many of these players saw as the challenges or the potential bottlenecks for broadly deploying CRISPR gene editing in all the ways that you might hope you could in the long term. And always at the top of that list was a question around specificity, meaning how do you be very sure that you make the edit at the site in the genome that you intended and you avoid off-target consequences? And so hearing that over and over and over again and, and obviously understanding from a, a safety and ultimately efficacy perspective how valuable specificity is, that really focused and drove a lot of the research that we've done at the company for years um, and led us to modifying the guides, uh, which I think is a little bit of a, a unique approach. Uh, I think most groups, as they look at the CRISPR-Cas9 system, they sort of ignore the guide molecules and focus on Cas9 and, and try to change Cas9 to give the system new functionality. Um, we're RNA biochemists by training, and so we see a lump of protein that gets in the way, but these marvelous nucleic acids that you can do something with. And so we're, we're really pleased with the enhanced functionality that comes from the Chardonnay guides. Yeah, and I wanted to, uh, sorry about that, I wanted to dig in a little bit on the, that detail, and it's a great name, by the way, Chardonnay, but it's obviously descriptive as well bi about the biochemistry. So why does that work, making that guide RNA chimeric, and, and what is it about the energetics of the base pairing that, that um, you know, make it potentially better, more specific, less off-target effects? Yeah, so this gets into the weeds pretty quickly. I'll, I'll try to keep it high level. Sure. Um, really two reasons why the Chardonnay guys were, guides work as well as they do to improve specificity. One is actually about nucleic acid biophysics. So it turns out for a given sequence, the affinity of an RNA-DNA hybrid is higher than the affinity of a DNA-DNA hybrid. And so the inclusion of DNA nucleotides actually tunes down the affinity of the Cas9 guide complex for target DNA. That might be counterintuitive at first, but it turns out you actually want to decrease the affinity of the system so that Cas9 is still able to appropriately engage with the right site in the genome and edit it, but is less likely to engage with the wrong sites elsewhere in the genome. The second component actually relies on how finicky Cas9 is as a protein, and it's very sensitive to the geometry of holding on to a guide and targeting a piece of DNA and what that overall complex looks like. And it turns out Cas9 actually has to go through this massive uh, shape change before it can actually function. And so by changing the guides, we make it even more finicky for being in the right place before it can do that and make a cut. So, so would Chardonnay, I guess, would the, the modifications that you've made to the guide RNA, is, would that be applicable or could it be paired with other enzymes or is it a Cas9 specific? Um, approach. We believe it can be paired with, with other enzymes, um, such as CPF1 or some of the other CRISPR systems as well. 
Okay, great. And, and just with respect to specificity, I mean, obviously off-target uh, edits um, are one of the critical things to avoid uh, with gene editing. But also there's, you know, a recent literature on uh, wh what I've referred to as on-target, um, um, you know, unintended edits uh, being like large indels or things that happen at the actual site of the guide RNA. So you may have increased specificity for the intended site, but you could be getting some proportion of unintended translocations, large deletions. Um, so how does Chardonnay, I guess, interplay with that potential off-target effect? Do you have data exploring that and comparing it to sort of traditional CRISPR-Cas9 approach? Yeah, great, great question. Um, you know, one of the challenges that arises from making multiple edits or, or doing what we call multiplex genome editing, like we're doing for CB10, is that as you're making multiple modifications without the genome, throughout the genome, you have multiple double-strand breaks. Um, and to your point, one of the ways that cells can handle that is to actually uh, create these massive chromosomal translocations, uh, which from a, a safety perspective is obviously something we'd like to be able to minimize. Um, and so we've actually worked quite hard at Caribou to come up with a way to try to mitigate those risks. Um, in the literature, there's evidence from other groups that on average using, say, a Talon system, you might see about 4% of the cells, if you make two edits, 4% of the cells will have these translocations. And we've been able to come up with a new way to deliver our reagents that can drive us from that about 4% down to about 0.1%, and for some locations, even below our limit of detection. So we're really excited about those improvements coming from delivery. Um, and where Chardonnay sort of slots into thinking about the, the larger question is, that's between on target and on target. But of course, if you have off target consequences, you also have the chance that multiple off targets or maybe one off target and one on target could be causing translocations as well. And so by starting with a system that has fewer off target events in the first place, we know we are minimizing the number of translocations that will be occurring in the cell. And just maybe quick on delivery, what is the delivery method that you guys use? Is it electroporation like we see for other ex vivo approaches? Yeah, so we use AV6, which obviously is delivered via viral transfection to get that car cassette in. And then the Cas9 protein and the Chardonnay guide, we directly deliver via electroporation. Okay, great. Um, so maybe with the couple minutes we have left, I'd love to touch quickly on the human therapeutics development program, the status of that, sort of next steps there. Uh, and then at the end uh, on the uh, Bugs as Drugs program as well. So first on the Human Therapeutics program, um, what can we look forward to in 2019? Yeah, great, great question. Um, we've made some excellent preclinical progress with that program so far and have some very nice animal data uh, evidencing our ability to rapidly clear CD19 bearing tumors using this um, preclinical candidate. And our goal for that program is to be in the clinic in the first half of next year. Um, so stay tuned for quite a bit more data that we'll be talking about later this year and, and early next year. Okay, and then uh, one area I think that differentiates you guys from a lot of the other players in this field is is uh, the microbial program and, and that approach. And um, maybe just in the two minutes we have left, I'd love for you to just expand on that, explain to us what you're doing there and, and you know why that's a, a really interesting uh, area for CRISPR-Cas9 or Chardonnay-Cas9. Yeah, it's a space that I'm personally very excited about. Um, and I think we at Caribou look at the microbiome a little bit differently from a, a number of other drug developers. I think a lot of folks look at it and try to figure out which species do we need to remove, which species do we need to add, what collection is the right collection to have for a specific indication. Um, and that's no doubt very appropriate and very useful in certain circumstances. That's just not how we think about the world. We instead look at the collection of organisms that already exists and ask what very simple changes, one gene at a time, can we make to have hopefully a profound impact for these patients. Uh, and I'll give you an example of a, a technology proof of concept experiment that we did last year where we looked at a circumstance of uh, an FDA-approved small molecule chemotherapeutic that's been used for decades that's known to have a significant toxic side effect. And it turns out the toxicity comes from gut microbes. As the small molecule goes through the GI tract, the bugs actually pick it up, do chemistry on it, and turn it into a toxic compound. And that's why patients get so sick. And so we were able to demonstrate using our gene editing capabilities that we could take those organisms, just delete that one enzyme pathway, give those engineered microbes back to mice, dose them with the chemotherapeutic, and they no longer have the toxic side effects. 
And so we think that's the type of potential that the system has to really come in with laser focus in order to solve problems one gene at a time for therapeutic applications. Great. And, and just from a corporate strategy standpoint, are, you're plowing ahead with, with both the, the bugs as drugs and human therapeutics applications. We are, absolutely, in large part because the microbiome is so important in terms of immunotherapy and is such a profound influencer on whether patients do or do not respond, and so that's a, a mission-critical area for us. Great. Well, I, I think that's really interesting. Um, well, I just wanted to thank you, Rachel, for your time, and, and uh, great to hear about the update and the introduction. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah.